What's up everybody and welcome back to the channel. The 2023 BDC season is officially underway with the San Diego Regional wrapping up this past weekend. Over 500 players, I think around 550, just a crazy number of participants in this tournament. And it was just an amazing tournament. We saw so many awesome teams, way more variety than I expected, and just some incredibly cool trends that the meta is going to be taking in the run-up to the Liverpool Regional in a couple of weeks. I was there, I was able to finish top 32, which is really not bad. I was able to make top cut. Uh, that's always my goal, just to, to make top cut. I think it's, my personal opinion is that it's a little bit unhealthy to expect too much, given that we play a game that kind of has some elements of RNG in it. So I'm pretty happy with my performance. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. I wanted to talk a little bit about my run through the tournament, uh, the team I used, some of the other teams that we saw, and where I think the meta is going to go for Liverpool. We do know that the next North American regional in Orlando is going to be played on Series 2 rules, but there is still one more regional for Series 1. So we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the meta development for that, and then I'll be releasing a couple videos in sort of the run-up to Series 2 in the next week or two. First things first, let's check in on the standings. This is the second tournament this season. Technically, the London Open happened at Worlds. That's the first tournament of the season. It's also a regional level tournament. So looking at this, you can see uh, Jisok Lee is top of the North American region after winning this tournament. Uh, Wolf is in second because he also picked up a fair amount of points from the London Open. Uh, your boys down here in eighth, which is the goal. So basically, the top eight in North America are going to get an invitation directly to day two of Worlds. That's my goal for this season, and uh, we're on track. I got 60 from the London Open. I got 60 from uh, from San Diego, and uh, yeah, that's we're, we're doing good. But what about the team that I use? Because if you clicked on this video, you will have seen the thumbnail. You will have seen the title. I used a pretty cool team. I present to you my team. This is the team that I used in San Diego. I used Pomot, Murkrow, Scissor, Mousehold, Meowskarata, and Annihilate. I actually fact-checked this before I started recording, but I am the only person in the top 128 players who used a Scissor, which I think is really cool. I've never had a super unique Pokemon on a team that I've done really well with at a regional, so uh, shout-outs to Scissor, who MVP'd a lot of my games. I'm not going to lie. I kind of hinted at it in my preview video. Scissor's really good. It's not as splashable as something like King Gambit, but there are teams where Scissor is better than King Gambit, and I think a lot of teams could use it. Trust me. Like, try it, please. I beg you. Scissor deserves love. But yeah, the team is a really, really interesting team. Basically, I built it around the Mousehold Annihilate combination. Uh, we have the Friend Guard Mousehold, and this thing can beat up the Annihilate to make it have really, really powerful Rage Fists. Uh, it gives you this really instant offensive pressure that the opponent has to respect. And then what I also did was I built in a second hyper offensive mode with a Choice Banded Miascarada, Tailwind on the Murkrow, and Palmont as well. So... A lot of people would over-focus on the mouse hold and the annihilate mode, and I could really exploit that by knowing, ah, they know this is a big threat, so they have to lead something that can deal with it. And a lot of the time, the thing that deals with the mouse ape is not really good at dealing with Miascarada. So I would lead the Miascarada, put on a lot of pressure, take out maybe one, maybe two Pokemon, lose the Miascarada, and then bring in the Palmot, revive the Miascarada, and then send it back out and just have it continue punching things. It was really, really great. Um, and as you may have noticed, as I'm talking about some of these game plans, none of these game plans center around four Pokemon. I've got the Mousehold Annihilate, usually also with Miascarada. I've got the Miascarada, Murkrow, Palmont. And that's kind of why Scissor is really cool on this team. It's just a Pokemon that's pretty good. It doesn't really need to have a specific role on the team. It's just really good into most of the meta, and that allows it to sort of slot into either of the modes if I want it. Sometimes I can run the mouse hold with the Meowskarada to make it a little more tanky with the friend guard. Sometimes I can run the scissor with the Annihilate and the, uh, the mouse hold mode to give me a little bit more pivoting. And then the Terra Water is also just a really great way to keep it alive. Obviously, Scissor only weak to fire, so making it a water type is really, really cool. But also, Terra Water with Terra Blast is just very, very good into the current meta. You have a lot of fire types running around with things like Terra Fire Annihilate. Terra Fire on Hydreigon is pretty common. Terra Fire on Garchomp's kind of around as well. So, I love him. I love my little Scissor Boy. He did great for me. Honestly, the only Pokemon that was a little bit of a disappointment was Murkrow, and that's because I didn't hit a single Dondozo this tournament. I built this team to be really strong into Dondozo, and I played zero of them, which was 
nice because I didn't have to play Dondozo, but honestly really kind of annoying because I built this team to beat Dondozo and then didn't play any Dondozos. But this is the team. Uh, I'm not sharing the EV spreads or a rental code just yet because I am considering bringing it to Liverpool in a couple of weeks. It's one of my options. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be sharing any of the spreads. But if you guys want to take a crack at sort of recreating the spreads yourselves, I highly recommend it. I think this is uh, one of the better Annihilate Mousehold teams at the event. I thought that I... Um, built a pretty cool team here i think it's really really fun to use so absolutely feel free to go try it out uh and with, with some of your own spreads and uh yeah let me know in the comments below if you think the team is cool and if you do try it out let me know how it goes so i did kind of want to talk about my run through the tournament vgc paste has already updated everything for san diego and they've done an incredible job of just having everything they have every opponent that every player played and what table number it was at it's i don't know how they compiled this much information it's a little overkill, but it's awesome, and I love them. So, we can see in this row here the people I played against. And uh, I just kind of wanted to walk through the, the people I played because I honestly didn't play that many players that I knew, but I had one of the highest resistances in the entire tournament. And the way resistance is calculated is uh, it's the people you played against, what their win rate was. So, even though I didn't play Wolf, I didn't play James Beck or James Evans or Joe Ugardi, I didn't play a lot of super famous people, the people I played are new players that did super, super well. So I wanted to give them a little bit of props here and just kind of talk through a couple of the matches. The big one that I want to talk about is Juan Sandoval. Um, this guy was my round three at 2-0. So I went into this one. I sat down. We chatted a little bit. There was a little bit of a delay to the start of the round. And the guy told me it was his first regional. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. In my head, I'm going, ah, he must have had a couple of easy rounds to start with. Um, this is a pretty lucky draw for me. Let's go. And then he shows me his phone. And it's like, yeah, I beat Connor Svikart in round one. And um, who was it in round two? He, he beat somebody else really good in round two. And I was just like, oh, well then. Uh, then he proceeded to beat me 2-0. And I was like, oh, well then. That, that's that's a thing. Now, this guy, it's his first ever tournament, I think he said. Uh, like, including online. I don't think he's ever played in a tournament, if I'm not mistaken. He got 34th at this tournament. He got so close to day two, uh, just missing out on resistance. And uh, I thought that he deserved a whole lot of credit for that. Um, looking at this, we, we see his team from the open team sheets. He actually uh, included his paste uh, or included his uh, EVs, which is kind of nice. But uh, yeah, he was running a hybrid Trick Room Rain team. And I had an okay but not great matchup into Rain. And also an okay but not great matchup into Trick Room. So I really was not prepared for Trick Room Rain. Uh, and it was really, really cool. We got the Palafin in here. We've got Trick Room on the Miascarada. And uh, the, the Pelipper to set Tailwind as well. Hariyama was able to really get under my skin and do a lot as well. I think uh, the first game came down to the Hariyama just having enough with this uh, defense investment that it definitely won him that game. I think he lived on like 2 or 3 HP after I basically hit him with a bunch of foul plays um but yeah like this team is super super cool he did really really well with it and his own matches didn't get easier uh they really like he he went to 5-0 i think and then he started dropping games but uh he played some really really incredible players he did really really well so if you guys are looking for a name to keep an eye on for the future juan sandoval uh is definitely worth your respect and uh your attention because he played incredibly well this weekend joshua mechem and nora bowman in my rounds five and eight respectively were super fun uh i like nora's great uh friend of mine we play together sometimes online but the 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 trend here is that both of these folks beat me in swiss last year uh so mechem jo uh, joshua mechem beat me in salt lake city at, at i think three and oh in a matchup that was very very important and i thought i had it won in game three and then i think i misplayed if i'm remembering correctly i think i threw and was really frustrated about that uh but i was able to come back win this one 2-1 it was a close set he played really really well and then Nora was able to make cut even though I beat her in round eight. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, I got a little lucky in this one. Nora beat me in Indianapolis. And uh, I was able to win this one here. It was a really well played set on both sides. I think in I won 2-0. But in game two it came down to a Draco Meteor miss. Uh, that may or may not have mattered. But I think it probably mattered. Because Draco Meteor is a pretty big damaging move. So uh, dodging that was really really helpful. And uh, it was it was nice to get a little bit of revenge on people who beat me in the last season. So I, I feel like 
it's a bit of a mark of personal improvement. One of the things that I'm working on this season is I want more consistency in Swiss. So being able to play against people who are really, really good and I, people who I know are capable of beating me and coming out and winning just felt really, really nice. John Hu was a really fun match. He had a really wonky team. John Hu is famous for his wacky teams. He ran uh, Lugia at a regional last year and did pretty well. And uh, just all, overall, he always has something up his sleeve. This one was funny because the matchup was really, really bad for me. And honestly, we it was probably the worst played set of the day. I played really poorly. He made a few really key mistakes. But uh, what, what this came down to was that I had a really bad matchup, but I also had Scissor, and he had no way to hit Scissor. In game number one, Scissor sat on the field for like eight or nine turns being spored over and over again and it just didn't didn't go down like i was just able to keep waking up and hitting him going back to sleep sleeping two turns waking up hitting him a couple more times and uh, the only things he had were things like hyper voice on indeedy and i think his amoongus had sludge bomb so it just literally couldn't hit me so uh, this one was uh, was a big scissor mvp moment at uh, at four and one so that was a really really nice uh, match as well just because it was the one that scissor got to shine in the most and it was against a really respectable player like john who is somebody that Everybody who's around the scene knows John Who, so it's kind of cool to be like, yeah, my scissor won that one. That's so cool. Uh, and then we had Ragna in round nine, which was a big one. Like, oh, Tauros was everywhere in this tournament. We'll talk about the meta shifts in a sec, but uh, Ragna ran fire Tauros, and Ragna also did really, really well. If we look, oh, this isn't it. Uh, he finished in 35th, so I played against, but I feel so bad. Oh, man, I lost my round 10, and if I would have won, their resistance might have been good enough to go for into the top 32 so i'm really sorry juan and i'm really sorry ragna but um yeah ragna was running a really interesting team he had uh, a fire tauros though and i think that was honestly what cost him this game his strategy to counter annihilate was to intimidate it deliberately give me the defiance boost and then mirror herb the boost onto the tauros which was incredibly cool. Uh, not the only person we saw using Mirror Herb Taurus at this tournament, but it was the first time I'd seen it, and it scared the bejesus out of me. Uh, if this was a Taurus Water, I would have lost. I Like, I would have had an incredibly difficult time here. I would have lost pretty handily. But uh, I was able to clutch it out 2-1. It was a pretty close set. All three games took a... I, I think it was down to like a 1-0 at the end of every single game. It was a really, really close one. But... Uh, I, I thought this team deserved some some uh, love and some some praise. Uh, you can see the rental code is up on the top right. Ragna posted it on Twitter as well, and I think he posted a little bit of a short analysis of the team too, so check that out for sure. But uh, this was the one that got me into Top Cut. Uh, we played this match at 7-1. and one. Based on the number of people in the tournament, it was a guarantee that if you went X and 2, you were going to Top Cut. So going into round 10... I did not need to win. I played against Alberto Lara, who did not need to win. Um, I wanted to play out the set because Ragna is somebody that I like a lot, and I wanted to sort of, and, and Nora as well, I wanted to help them out and try to boost their resistance. But since I was already in the next round, I didn't really want to show a lot of information because while the moves are public, the spreads are not. So I tried to avoid using uh, things like Scissor. Nobody really knows what the Scissor spread is, so I didn't want to show Alberto in case I played him the next day. So... I kind of handicapped myself. Uh, in fairness, so did Alberto. He just kind of clicked make it rain and like <laughs> earthquake and rock slide the whole time. Both of us played this set, not really looking to show any information. Uh, he did come out on top at a pretty close 2-1, though. It was a fun set, honestly. It was just weird, but we were vibing. We, we both knew we were done for the day. We were just kind of having a having a good time. But uh, Alberto Lara did really, really well as well. He got top 16, I think, at the end of it all. So that was kind of my run in a nutshell. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the teams. So first things first, we have to talk about Jisook's tournament winning team, obviously. I'm going to go and go ahead and hide my camera real quick so you can see the whole thing, but this is Jisook's team. I said Miascarada was going to win, which is the coldest take in the world. I also said that Baxcalibur would win a regional at some point. I did not think it was going to be this regional. I did say Mimikyu was going to do really well, though, so uh, this was kind of cool. Thank you for uh, making me look real, real smart, Jisook. But, uh... This team's awesome. There's going to be so much analysis of it that I don't want to spend too much time on, but I love the loaded dice back Scalibur. A lot of people were still unfamiliar with how exactly loaded dice work. Um, if you use loaded dice, you literally cannot hit Ice School Spear less than four times. It's a 50-50, I think, between four and five hits, which makes Icicle Spear a guaranteed 100 base power move with full accuracy, which is awesome. A Pokemon with as much attack as Baxcalibur doesn't really need to run something like a Life Orb or an Expert Belt, so having that guaranteed increase to Icicle Spear's base power is amazing. 
And uh, what was really interesting about this team is that while we do have a lot of cool stuff, uh, Terra Poison on the Garganacle, for example, he said was because uh, he was struggling with Glamora, something that none of us were preparing for, but was actually at this tournament. We'll talk about that in a sec as well. But uh, basically, the, the Terra Poison was to turn Garganacle into a poison type so it could then switch in and absorb the toxic spikes. If you're not a singles player, you might not know this, but uh, if a poison type switches in on toxic spikes, the toxic spikes go away. The rest of this team super cool. You got the Tauros in here along with like half the other teams in cut. Specs Golden Go and um, the Mimikyu as well. Power Gem on the Golden Go is something that's been rising a little bit as well. It's really, really nice to deal with things like Volcarona. And Life Orb Mimikyu is just a very, very good damage dealer. But this team, I actually don't think was the best team at the tournament by a pretty wide margin. If you watched the matches... Maluka won because of his incredible play. Like, Jisok just outgamed everyone. It felt like a lot of his leads created 50 50 situations, which is, in my opinion, not the most optimal thing because you don't have like a, a like a lead like a lead that's gonna be good. It felt like he always was playing these 50 50 games, but Jisok is just he lives in his opponent's brain rent free a hundred percent of the time so it felt like every single time he went for something that looked like a coin flip he got it right a hundred percent of the time and it's crazy now obviously that didn't happen through the whole tournament he did lose some sets lose some games but uh, when it came to day two especially in the final he was able to uh, orchestrate situations that were so uncomfortable and somehow always come out on top it's Honestly, an incredible performance by Jisok, and if you didn't watch all of the games, I highly recommend going back and watching his matches, because the way that Jisok plays is just on another level. It's it's ungodly, and it's honestly scary to think about potentially having to play against him at other tournaments, <laughs> but uh, that's Jisok's team. Uh, Chuppa's was a really, really cool variation of the Don Dozo as well. It was something that I prepped against a little bit, because I'm uh, friends with a couple of his friends who ran the same team, but uh, I love the Palmot. The way the Palmot works here is... Not the same as mine, so he does have the Palmot Miascarada that I have, but it's a little bit different. Uh, actually, wait, no, he does have the Band of uh, Miascarada. So he has the Revival Blessing Miascarada strategy that I talked about that I used, but he can also use this to revive Tatsugiri or Don Dozo. And with Don Dozo having rest, yeah, sure, you KO'd the Don Dozo, but he revives it again and then is able to just rest it back up to full. Or Tatsugiri was, uh, he can lead Tatsugiri with, like, muddy water and just, like, try to get some chip or try to get some icy winds off. And even if he loses the Tatsugiri before switching the Dondozo in, the Pomok can bring it back. So, it creates a lot of mind games that the opponent has to play, which, as the Dondozo player, you don't really have to play because... I, as an opponent, for example, have to always be worried, what if the Palmok comes out? What if this happens? What if this happens? Or as Chuppa knows what's in the back, and he can just play to the optimal line 100% of the time. It's a super, super cool team. Aaron Brock got fourth in the tournament with Dreadnought, so I feel like we should probably talk about that real quick. Um, about two, three weeks ago, when the rain teams were first starting to come up, a lot of rain teams were doing well in tournaments, but almost all of the time... They had Dreadnought, but the pilot would say on Twitter or something after the fact that they never brought Dreadnought. Dreadnought's actually really bad. So to see a rank team that's, like, so heavily centered around Dreadnought do well is awesome. Like, Clippers, Aaron did an awesome job this tournament. He played out of his mind. Um, I This is another one of those teams where I look at it and I'm like, I don't get it. But it got fourth. So it's obviously good. But, I like, I feel like it's even more just... Aaron playing like a god so uh credit to the play and also to the team though it's really really neat brick break on the king gambit's fun terra flying on king gambit was pretty popular this weekend and a lot of terra grass here we got the the grass on the miascarada to be able to be even stronger with the flower trick uh grass on the dreadnought to get rid of the grass weakness and also to be immune to spore and things like that and the same with the pelipper which is kind of kind of cool so overall i think this is a really cool team that Aaron was able to use and looking further down, we have things like Glamora. Glamora is a super cool team. Uh, this Emilio team was awesome. Basically, the Glamora here is uh, to force your opponent into a really awkward spot. He has a very stally mode with the Don Dozo. He could just be defensive for days. So he leads the Glamora, and you have to choose. You hit the Glamora, and then you have Toxic Spikes on your side of the field, which is very bad when you're dealing with the Don Dozo later on. Or you don't hit the Glamora, and the Choice Specs Glamora nukes you. So it's really a rock at a hard place kind of deal, where it's really not great if the opponent's running poison types, like the Poison Garganacle. But most 
teams are not going to run a poison type. It's not that popular of typing right now. I don't have a poison type. I can't think of that many teams that do have a poison type. So it was an awesome meta call for Emilio. He went 10-0 and zero in Swiss, which was incredible. Finally ended up losing to Chuppa, I believe, in top eight. But an incredible performance by Emilio once again as well. Just one of the most consistent players in, in the scene. He just always seems to do well. So what's up with the Salamences? Uh, it's not that many that we're seeing right here, but we have a Salamence here in third from Jody. We have a Salamence uh, further down in top cut here with Cedric Bernier. A couple of Salamences showed up, which is uh, a bit of a weird one. Nobody was really talking about Salamence. Uh, it was a cool idea. Basically, the way Jody wanted to use his Salamence was uh, he used it as a special attacker with a Life Orb plus Intimidate, which is super, super cool. But there was a team that a couple of people brought to this tournament where they basically took the Salamence uh, and did what the High Dragons were doing. They used essentially Focus Energy, Scope Lens, uh, Salamence instead of the uh, High Dragon, just because it was faster than the High Dragon, so it could take out the opposing High Dragons first. It was an interesting idea. I kind of liked it. Uh, not the one that did super well. I feel like it's probably on this one down here, though, by Cedric Bernier. Uh, nope, this is the same one. I'm an idiot. But, hey, people did bring that. Uh, something that I thought was fun and uh, worth mentioning. And then, of course, all of these Tauros. Why Tauros? Well, something that's been a thing over the last few weeks is that Intimidate has been phased out. At the very beginning of the format, we saw a lot of clear amulet usage. And then even when the clear amulet fell off, we saw a lot of King Gambit and a lot of Annihilate. So people were expecting to not have to deal with Intimidate that much. Because why would you bring Intimidate into a tournament when the meta is so anti-Intimidate? But what they realized is they realized that actually a lot of Annihilates are essentially forced into running Terra Fire. So they're immune to burn. And you don't really have to care about giving the Annihilate a Defiant Boost if you have a Terra Water Tauros that just blows through it. So they were able to use that Tauros to have access to Intimidate while also not dying to the Annihilate, which is really, really nice. And of course, even the King Gambit, if it's uh, not going to Terrastalize, you just take it out with the Close Combat super easily. So Tauros proved to be the perfect way to obviously have Intimidate but also to counter the two biggest threats to Intimidate with Annihilate and King Gambit. So players finally found a way to have their cake and eat it too in this meta, and Tauros was huge this weekend. You can see on the screen how many Tauros. It won the tournament two more times, three more times in top eight. Uh, Giovanni is the guy who beat me. Uh, the Tauros was the reason why I had such a hard time into his team. Uh, also, shout out to Giovanni, by the way. I had a very good matchup into him on paper, and he just... He apparently prepped till about 2.33 in the morning to find the lines, and it was a very close set that he was able to win out, which was just, it was such a bad matchup for him, and he was able to just outplay me. So big shout-outs to Giovanni. Uh, just did amazing in that match, and continued on going all the way to top eight. So huge shout-outs to him. Uh, Wolf was able to bring a different Don Dozo team. He actually brought an Annihilate here. Is this Final Gambit? Uh, okay. Uh, Wolf is arguably the best player of all time, so I'm not going to argue with him, but I'm not a huge fan of the final Gambit Annihilate myself. The rest of the team, though, is super cool, and I, I've talked about this a couple times, uh, at least on stream. I feel like Don Dozo Tatsugiri is just a very, very high skill ceiling team. If you're an amazing player like Chuppa, like Wolf, you can really do a lot of really cool stuff with the Don Dozo Tatsugiri teams, and Wolf was able to do super, super well uh, getting all the way to top 16. Not quite as far as somebody of Wolf's caliber would have liked, but still a very, very solid start to the season for him rain was another super prevalent thing that we saw a lot of this weekend so much pelipper two in the top four another one down here in ninth and palafin was just insane jody was able to use palafin and what was interesting is that on the the sort of meta before the tournament most people were just running choice band palafin you don't need it you really don't uh the mystic water palafins were the ones that i thought were the scariest we do see uh, a Mystic Water Palafin here on Jody's team. I'm not 100% sure what Gavin was running, but I think it's also Mystic Water. No, his is banded, but I think uh, it's crazy. One of the things that stuck out to me was I had a game against a Rain team where I faced off against a Mystic Water Palafin. I got a bulk up on my Annihilate for plus one defense, and I had Friend Guard, and it hit me for 90% with Wave Crash, which was just insane. It was in the rain, but still, I was at plus one with Friend Guard. That's nuts. 
So uh, that one interaction made me respect non-banded Palafin so much more, and it just it did so well this week. And Pelipper obviously did even better. I felt like Palafin kind of had to be on a team with Pelipper, but Pelipper can run a lot of other stuff. You can use the Tauros as a way to take advantage of it, the Dreadnought that Aaron Brock did. And uh, it was really, really cool to see the uh, the rain teams do as well as they did gyarados got a showing here in top 21 or in top 32 with the 21st with nora uh, oh yeah nora had a metacham this was crazy uh, metacham's not a pokemon that exists in the meta right now but it was also really fast she built it to be super fast which i saw trick room on it and it's also like a kind of middling speed pokemon so i played out one of the games against her where i was 100 percent sure the game was over and that i'd won and then the metacham was faster than my pretty fast annihilate and just ko'd it uh that was really really cool at the end of the day i could talk about the stuff we see here in top cut for hours there's so much cool stuff some armor rouge stuff some indeedy armor rouge skeledurge making an appearance arcanine here and there sylveon there's so many unique pokemon there's a salazzle up here sableye in 17th try the teams if you're still going to be playing some series one take some of these pastes go on the ladder try them out they're so much fun to play in this format there's just so many things you can do and so many ways to play it's it's awesome it's just so cool to see how vibrant this series one meta is and i know a lot of people are really sad that uh the meta is so good and we're only going to get it for one more event but my take is actually that you know i i would have liked for the format to be a little longer don't get me wrong but i don't think the format is as good as it is because of this individual format i think it's because of terrestrialization and open team sheets which are gonna stay Series 2 is going to be open team sheet with terrestrialization. The rest of the generation is probably going to be that way. And I think it speaks to the level of uh, of creativity that terrestrialization allows you to use. I can't wait to see how people continue to play in Series 1 for the rest of this uh, month. And then in Series 2, Series 3, beyond. I think we're going to have just the most incredible metagames for the next three years. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We don't know what the DLC is going to bring, but... At least for the next uh, for this season up until Worlds, I'm so, so optimistic. I think it's going to be so fun to see how these formats develop. One last thing that I want to talk about before we end the video is that the event ran super, super smoothly. I know that I was super worried, as were a lot of other players, that with the state of the game, there's a lot of bugs, there's visual bugs, there's connectivity issues. We saw some of those on stream. We also saw some of those in the games that we were playing. But the judging staff put in a ton of work to find out what causes the bugs, how can we preemptively prevent them, and what can we do to uh, mitigate them if they happen. And the judging staff did a great job this weekend. Uh, it is never the organizer's fault if there's kind of some bugs in the game, but it wasn't detrimental to the experience. I know there are people who have been, been a little bit apprehensive about going to some of these events at the earlier stages of the season because of the state of the game. So to all of you out there, if you have that opinion, I say do it. You know, the event was a blast. It ran really smoothly. The games were fun. And uh, it's just always great to see people. It's looking to be an absolutely insane season. We just had signups for Orlando a few hours before I'm recording this. 750 people signed up. It will be by far the biggest regional of all time. Liverpool is in two weeks. It's 550 people. It's going to be the most crazy season of VGC, potentially ever, probably ever. And uh, I can't wait to be a part of it. I can't wait to continue bringing you guys content about it. So that's going to do it for this recap video. I tried to give it a little bit of a structure, but I also kind of wanted to explore the event through a couple of different lenses. So let me know in the comments below, do you like the story time aspect, talking about my own run? Do you like uh, me talking about my team? Do you like me talking about other people's teams? Which parts of this video did you like? Because I'd love to do more preview content and post-regional coverage stuff as well as the season progresses, because uh, the way things are looking, we're going to have so much to talk about after every single event so let me know which parts of this video you liked uh give me some feedback if you have any and of course if you liked the video drop a like subscribe to the channel ring the bell trying to get to a thousand subs so that i can uh, get that sweet youtube partnership but uh, in the meantime i have to go make some content because i'm home for four days before i go to europe and start <laughs> getting ready for liverpool so um i'm gonna head back into the content lab i hope you all have a wonderful morning afternoon evening or night whatever it is wherever you are in the world and i'll see you guys next time